Philip and I met through our profession. Uh, we do the same kind of thing. He has a company in uh, Toronto, Urban Forest Innovations. And for quite a number of years, we've collaborated on uh, projects when possible. It sounds crazy, Toronto, Seattle. But uh, we've actually come through here on the way to help researchers in the Redwoods, one of the stellar trips uh, both of us agree of our entire lives was to go down and find the big Redwoods together, uh, along with the science guys. Very fun. So Philip is uh, a consummate uh, knowledge guy and a great presenter. I think you're really going to enjoy this presentation I'm going to give you. Phil Ben Watson. Thank you so much. So I, I say thank you, Scott. I also say thank you, Michael and Jake and all the people that invited me to come here today uh, to speak again. It's a real honor to be speaking uh, at this conference. I speak all over the world, but um, I got to do this a couple of times, and they're really some of my favorite uh, places to be to give presentations. So um, it's really quite nice to be here again. Um, I was uh, here, I guess, first in 2007, so I guess that was the 10th. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that through the, through the course of the, of the presentation. So I guess the, the title of my talk is The Tree in Treehouse. And the theme of my thinking about being here today and in my presentation later on is that when we say the word treehouse, I would say it tree house. The house comes afterwards. The tree is the important part. And, uh, and I know that, you know, we, we tend to, as arborists, we tend to focus on trees and look up at them. And uh, as uh, I think treehouse people, when we look at pictures of treehouses, we're, you know, rightly so enamored by the treehouse, but it's the tree that is really at the root of it all. And um, so I'm going to try and uh, just go through some slides. I always have too many slides, so some of them I might go through quick and hopefully it looks like you can see them fairly well. And just to give you an idea about where sort of my passion for trees comes from and how, how I got to be here today. So I like to say I've been hanging around trees since I was a little kid. Uh, I actually fell out of my first tree when I was about four years old. And I already had glasses at that time. I fell flat on my face. My eyes turned up into prunes and my mom was horrified. But I got through that. Uh, then when I was seven years old, I was climbing the tree on my front lawn and encountered um, habitat, uh, a nest of bees. Uh, and uh, with uh, eight, eight attacks in the tree, I ended up falling out of that tree as well. Uh, but I persisted, and uh, my love for going up in height uh, took me into a, a long stint in my life as a rock climber. I climbed um, quite extensively around the world, especially in North America. And then I had to get serious and get back to school but when I was in school, someone said, you know what, Philip, they'll pay you to climb trees. And I couldn't believe it. You know, they were going to pay me for my passion. So I've had the sort of good fortune of taking some of my passions in life and streaming it into a career. And after I worked as a practicing arborist for a period of time, I went back and I got a master's degree in forest conservation, which really fit my, my you know, sort of approach. Uh, when I first started as a, as a tree climber, um, pretty early on in the first few weeks, uh, several days, my boss sent me out on a removal crew. And, you know, those of you who have worked with trees and have done removals or those who haven't, removals is really, um, it can be exciting, but it's pretty much, you know, cutting with saws all day, lifting wood. And for me, I just really wasn't that keen on that kind of work. And actually, at the end of those days, I just wasn't, wasn't really thrilled. So I went to my boss and I said, listen, I met you and I told you I was a climber, so why don't you put me in the trees and let me do the tree work. And so I was able to exercise my climbing skills and focus on aspects of keeping trees there rather than taking them away. And, and so, as I said, I went back and got a master's in forest conservation with a focus on urban forestry. And from there, I started a consultancy. Uh, as they say in Britain, I hung up the tools and I started to work as a consultant. And it was a it was kind of a, a rocky shift. Sometimes I didn't have work, but I wanted to stick with it because um, I recognized that there was a lot of aspects of dealing with trees that weren't really being addressed in a very professional manner. So I do a whole variety of consulting work, uh, expert witness work, trees and construction, tree inventories, legal work. And 
because of my passion for working with old trees and conserving trees, one thing which came up really early on was risk assessment of trees. And, and that's going to be part of the focus of what I'm talking about. I think some of you saw the other day we were showing some instruments and some methods for testing trees. And I'm going to talk more about that in my talk this afternoon and do another demonstration of that. But I always can't help myself from starting these types of talks with urban forest benefits. And I won't go into it too much, but you know, it says urban forest, and I know that a lot of tree houses get built not right in an urban center. But this area here that we're in right now is, for all intents and purposes, from a tree perspective, an urban forest. It's an interaction between people and trees. And the people have the opportunity to do the best things for trees or to be their worst enemies. So we have all these types of benefits that we manage trees for um, and that we think about from trees uh, that aren't timber or firewood or the sort of traditional silvicultural goals of managing trees. So air quality, microclimate, property values, stormwater, energy conservation, noise reduction, and then in the end I get that down to here, wildlife habitat, something that's really important to me, and I think one that everybody around here can relate to is trees contribute to our physical and psychological well-being. So, you know, if you're feeling blue at the end of a hard day, if you can get to a forested area and go for a walk, you're going to feel yourself calm down and feel better. And I have the etc. because everybody here will have their own reasons why trees are important. Um, and from a, from a maximizing those types of benefits perspective, um, we have this graph where we've got leaf area or benefits on this axis and, and tree size slash age. And the point of this slide is that if, if we had only all these small trees around us, we wouldn't get very many of those benefits which I just spoke about. But as trees get larger and develop these large canopies, they become exponentially more valuable in all of those types of benefits to us. So one of the reasons that I got into uh, risk management and conservation is that in many areas, these trees are the ones that are disappearing, the ones that give the most benefits. And because of things like infill development and wanting to build bigger and more and hard surfaces, uh, when we're planting these trees, we're having less and less success getting them up to big trees. So that's sort of the big background about where I come from and, and why I'm interested in this. And then. Uh, as I mentioned, one of my big passions is actually working with old trees, and that's, I'm going to share a little bit about that uh, with you here. So when, we, when I started out, I was uh, working with a group called the Ontario Urban Forest Council in Canada where I live, and we were looking for a new initiative, and we decided to work with heritage trees, but we needed a definition. So I don't have too many, you know, I don't know if you can read these, but a heritage tree or a heritage plant uh, we got this description uh, put together by a professor at the, at the University of Toronto. And I'll just quickly read through it. It's an outstanding specimen due to size, form, and shape. It could be a distinctive community landmark. It could be associ associated with a historic person, a place, an event, or period. It could be a representative of a crop grown by our ancestors. So one of the things I've run into here in North America is uh, fruit tree species that were brought, uh, when, the, when the settlers came, they brought trees with them, the things they were used to. And in some cases, there have been found um, fruiting trees that no longer can be found anywhere in Europe where they've come from, but they're still here in remnant orchards, etc. And, and then, you know, the, uh, the second to last one, uh, a specimen recognized by members of community as deserving heritage recognition. So it doesn't have to be the biggest, the best, the oldest, in certain communities, there will be certain trees which they think deserve heritage value. And trees almost define some sort of a sense of place. And so to give you some idea about, about what these types of heritage trees can be, so this is an example of a cultural heritage tree. And uh, again, I'm not sure how well you can see these slides, but this is a tree called the Dancing Linden from Schassenbrunn in Germany. And Dancing Lindens were... Um, quite common in Europe, and I think especially in Germany. And the idea was, you can see a model here, it's, it's kind of a tree house actually, uh, but people don't live in it. In fact, the, the idea of the design was that this platform up here is where the townspeople would dance while the band played below them here. And here's, here's the tree itself, you've got people up on the, on the platform, 
And these trees, some of these trees are hundreds of years old. They're, they've been uh, maintained um, in the community. So here you can see the tree out of leaf, and you can see a lot of um, what are called pollarding cuts. Uh, I know in North America, what I've learned is that a lot of people, when they first see a, a, a tree like this, they go, oh my God, what did they do to that tree? They topped it, and, it, and we shouldn't do that, and that's against all the rules. But by maintaining this tree over time, here it is in, in almost present day, it's smaller than it was originally, but when we were doing some research about this tree, we found this slide on the internet, and it's a painting from about 200 years ago. And in the center of it, the centerpiece of the painting, is the dancing linden. So this is a tree that's been contributing to people's lives in a cultural way for hundreds of years, and it's still there today. And so, we, you know, these are types of examples where we've learned about uh, managing trees, uh, and, and maybe managing them in different ways than nature would, but managing them in a way that we can maintain them for long periods of time. Uh, this is another tree from Germany. It's called the Holy Adigna. It's a pilia tree, and, and a, a, or a linden, or a lime, they call it. In North America, we have the basswood, which is, uh, which is the, for the tilia here. And these trees are a species of trees that have a propensity or an ability to live for long periods of time. So this tree is called the Holy Adigna. Adigna was uh, the daughter of one of the kings of France, born into a life of opulence, but she chose instead to work as a nun. And she worked in this small community. And in the written history, she was described as the hermit nun. And between the years of 1075 and 1109, she lived in a small shack and the hollow at the base of this tree. And that was from 1075 to 1109. And I went to see this tree about six or seven years ago. So this tree is well over a thousand years old. Um, you know, and, and so again, a tree that, uh, and you can see that it's been managed, parts have been cut out. Part of the idea of these types of management techniques is to keep the trees relatively small so they don't break themselves apart. Um, Another example, this is a, a tree that I got to visit when I was in Great Britain, and Great Britain is home to uh, literally, you know, the largest collection of old and ancient trees anywhere in the world, as far as I know, and this is something like an 800 to 1,000 year old oak, and these are just dotted on the landscape everywhere in Britain, uh, and just again show us, you know, how long these trees can go. Coming a little closer to home, this is a live oak in Savannah, Georgia, and you can Hopefully, you can sort of see people underneath it here to give you a scale. Uh, and this one had a nice story in that there was a development site here, and they were going to take, you know, like modern development, nuke the whole site, and then build houses. Uh, Savannah said, no way, you're going to cut down this tree, and restricted him. And so he, he built the, built the um, subdivision with a road leading right up to that tree, and then a circle around it. And we got a chance to speak to him that day, and he told us that basically... Uh, he ended up making more money on this site by saving this tree and losing two building lots, but being able to charge more for all the people who had a view onto this tree and who lived in this community. So that's something which is very rare, I find, in my consulting career. Scott's shaking his head. You know, we're actually waiting, and we're getting older, and, and hopefully it'll happen sooner than later, that, that this would be more the norm than the exception, that people would consider the trees on a site and consider that perhaps they could build into that site and retain the trees. And so that's a, you know, perhaps a parallel to what we're doing here. You know, we, the, we want to build, but we want to retain the trees because that's what gives us the ambiance and the, and the specialness of, of the whole endeavor. And then, you know, the giant redwoods. Um, you know, Scott mentioned that uh, we, we, we had an opportunity uh, to, to go together to some of the biggest trees in the world. And uh, we went with um, the preeminent researcher, Steve Sillett, and we wanted to see whether some of our methods of sonic tomography would work on big trees, and he took us to the biggest tree in the whole forest. Uh, we ended up climbing this tree to uh, 347 feet up into the sky. Um, so that's an example of an outstanding specimen uh, that's lived. They estimate that tree is around 2,000 years old. Um, 
And there's the base of the tree uh, to give you an idea about the scale of it. I think at the, at the base across the bottom at ground level, the tree was something like 28 or 29 feet across. It was, uh, it was about a five minute journey just to take a walk around the tree. And how many um, sensors you got there? Uh, I think we had 66 sensors on this tree. <laughs> Uh, but that's another story. Um, so then, um, there's, I guess the, where, where some of these slides come from is a talk that I give that's entitled Conservation Arboriculture. And out of a recognition of the fact that there are these trees on the landscape that can grow to these really old ages. Um, this started with a, with a group in, in, in Great Britain, the Ancient Tree Forum. And they used to gather in places where there were these beautiful old trees, and they started to think about how can we, what can we do to better manage these old trees, especially some of these trees that were managed for a long time but had been left to their own devices, had been growing so big that they started to pull themselves apart. And out of that beginnings, um, over the next 15 years or so, there's been an evolution to where we have sort of this new avenue or, or, or uh, side of, of arboriculture, conservation arboriculture. And just a few points about it, it seeks to really look at, at, at taking an ecosystem approach to looking at the tree. Um, it's a multidisciplinary science, so the guys who in the ancient tree forum that started all of this, when they were more interested, they started to look, is there other science in other places that can help us to think about how to manage these trees? One of the really strong tenets with old trees is that trees are habitat. They're homes for a whole bunch of interdependent species. And those species have co-evolved um, with trees over time, over evolutionary time. And most things that are working with trees are tree associates. Even the fungi that, uh, as arborists, were trained many times. We see a, a bracket on a tree and we say, oh, that's a problem. But in many, many cases, it's not a problem. It's an associate of the tree starting to break down the old wooden material and not really having a negative effect. And then another important point, the last point, is to optimize the health of trees. You need um, to look above and below ground. And I'll reiterate again that we tend to look at trees and we see them up there. And that's obvious because that's what we can see. But we've got to remember that what keeps those trees alive is the root systems of the trees that are under the ground. And anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the biomass of the living material of a tree is underground. So if we see this big old tree standing beside us, you've got to imagine that somewhere around here, underneath it, there's almost as much wood in its root system underground as there is above ground. And, and you know, if there's only one message that I can give all of you today, that's protect the roots of your trees. We are all focusing on going up and installing, etc. But we've got to protect the roots of the trees. We can't forget that. And in my, in my longer talk this afternoon, I'm going to uh, go through some of those things and, and give some ideas about how we might do that. Um, so now, uh, I mentioned that uh, this whole veteran tree perspective started in the UK. And if you, it's hard to see, but... All the red dots on this picture here are collections of old and ancient trees. And the bigger the dot, the larger the collection, the more trees there are there. And you can see scattered across Europe some collections, but Great Britain is just packed full of them. Um, and in Europe, people have been working, this is another aspect of trees and, and, and actually tree knowledge that we have and that we can access. In Europe especially, there have been for thousands of years, people have been managing trees through different techniques to get wood products from them. So actually managing the trees as crops, not as crops like we do here, let them grow really big and then take everything away, but through techniques like pollarding, uh, coppicing, what they actually do is grow trees, cut them off, uh, and then let them grow again, and, and the par products that come out grow all at the same rate. So if you leave it for a short period of time, certain species, if you leave it for a year or two, you're going to get young, succulent growth. You can feed that to your animals. Other species of trees you might leave, like oaks, leave them for five or ten years, and you get posts for building with, and you get a whole crop of all of those posts at the same time. But it, on, this, on this picture, here, 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 almost every tree you see 
is a working tree. And the same in this old um, uh, um, painting here, another Polarda tree. These are very common techniques that were practiced for thousands of years to manage trees. And one of the outcomes of that was to build the respect of people for keeping trees on the landscape because it was in their best interest to manage the tree in such a way that it would keep living rather than just let it grow up and cut it down. Um, so that's what it looks like uh, when, when, uh, when the tree has been cut back and starts to grow. You see all these uh, similar sized pieces of wood uh, growing up. The pollard heads were often at six or seven feet off the ground because uh, if you made them lower, then these grazing animals would, would chew up your future products. Um, and so this would be, the, in Britain, they developed a lot of tree management techniques. So this would be uh, what they call a wood pasture technique. So where they've got grazing animals, but they're also growing trees at the same time. And um, what has happened, of course, in, 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 with industrialization in modern times, is we've developed a lot of different techniques for uh, how, we, how we create wood and dimensional wood and milling, etc. So these techniques of growing trees for those specific products in a lot of places have fallen to the wayside. But this is a picture from Holland, uh, the country where my family comes from, not too long ago. And in Europe, uh, uh, th this row of Polarda trees is actually being kept for the aesthetic that they're so used to. Whereas, I, as I said earlier, in North America, when people see trees like this, they go, why did they butcher these trees? This is terrible. Uh, yet, from another perspective, uh, when you've had this type of tree around for thousands of years, it becomes part of the cultural landscape that they actually are managing these trees, not really for products anymore, but to keep that aesthetic there. And, you know, they, all kinds of different management techniques. So here you see these are also managed trees, but you can see there, there's a whole forest here of these V-shaped trees, and uh, these are in Spain, and some of my colleagues in Britain gave me these, and I said, well, why would they do that? And evidently, the reason they did that is that they were actually growing trees to create timbers for building ships. So instead of having to shape these out, they grew them basically into the shape that they needed and then could use them to build boats. So these are techniques, again, that... Um, our tree management uh, techniques that is old, old knowledge. We've known this stuff for a long time and a lot of it has been lost. Um, and you can't quite see this slide very well, but what I wanted to show is this great big wall of green here. This is in, uh, in Vienna at um, uh, Schönbrunn, which is one of the old uh, castles of one of the, of the Austrian kings. And it's the Grand Allee where the, where the uh, carriages used to come into the palace. Um, but again, you know, by understanding management techniques, they've done these amazing things. So this, I, I, I of course, as an arborist, had to go around the back of this thing and say, how the hell did they grow this wall of, of, of green 40 or 50 feet high? And what they actually have is they have about four or five different rows of trees. And the ones down here are the smaller ones. They form the bottom part of the hedge. And progressively, what they've done is let the trees grow up and then prune one side of the canopy off and just let the, let the live part of it grow over into this hedge. And the biggest ones are the furthest back, and they curve over, and their canopies contribute to the top of that hedge. So the idea being that the reason I'm showing this again is that we've learned these management techniques. We know a lot how to work with trees. Um, and, and that's what's led to some of our modern thinking. What's that wall called? Uh, yeah, maybe, did you say pleaching? Yeah. Well, and the other and the other part of it is there's this great big scaffold here, uh, four stories high, and they they can roll that scaffold along so that the pruners can go up and just prune the ends of the leaves off. When you prune the ends of the leaves off, they tend to grow sideways and grow thicker, just like you grow a hedge. Philip, is that between the United States and Mexico? <laughs> you can send you can the, send the slide to Sir Donald as a suggestion uh, and, and so as I mentioned earlier uh, when the ancient tree forum was trying to figure out um, their direction and, and what to do uh, they started to look for other science and other research and this work here this sort of life stages and tree morphology work comes from a gentleman named Pierre Rambeau 
in France who did a, a, a ton of research looking at canopy morphology, different shapes and, and ways that tree canopies could grow. But also through that work going all across the world, he also made observations on how trees age over time. And he came up with these life stages of trees, starting from a seedling into a sapling and working up to, you know, let's say this stage, the stage seven, which in America we would call the champion tree, the biggest, tallest, widest, the best. In, in many people's opinion. Uh, but what we can see here is that actually, after that, there are these later stages, the 8, 9, and 10 stages. And these are the stages of the old and ancient trees. And they're normal, and tree, many trees can attain these. But what happens is they start to die off in the canopy. They start to get smaller. But at the same time as they get smaller in the top, they reinvent themselves in the bottom with new growth. And so I'm just pointing to this in, in terms of, you know, how trees age. But I think from a treehouse perspective, we might be more interested in using trees in the 5, 6, and 7 stage and maybe not targeting these trees that are more in the ancient stage because they're, you know, they're the, the old uh, geriatrics. Uh, they do tend to get um, defects in them, but they're also really special. So, you know, someone else, I think, suggested earlier or yesterday that Perhaps what we need to do is think about building in these trees, but have a view on some of these trees, because these trees are really special. Uh, a couple of other things, though, just with aging trees. The root systems change over time. As the trunk gets wider, the connection to the roots is always on the outside, so the original roots that were there probably die off, and new root systems grow. And then, as we get into these later stages, you can see that eventually, trees start to get hollow in the middle. And that's normal. It's normal for a tree to get hollow. It's not a problem for most trees to get hollow. Most of the things we do to trees are concepts that we've come up with thinking that they're good for trees. Um, I try and think from the perspective that trees have evolved over thousands or millions of years. And, um, and you know, we're somewhat presumptuous to think that in the short period of time that we're here that we know better. And certainly I know, um, you know, the business of arboriculture, uh, part of the reason that I do some of these talks on old trees and how to manage them is that we have wrong concepts that we've been ingrained in our training and in our thinking uh, that need to be broken down and we need to think differently, um, especially working with old trees. So I'll give you a quick little uh, visual tour about how this aging happens. These are all oak trees. Uh, and there are, as I, I tend to talk about oak trees with the old trees a lot, um, it's a species that across the globe tends to have this long life propensity, but there are other species, like I said, tilia, uh, sugar maples, uh, many different species that will live for a long time. But they go through these life stages, and this collection of photos was given to me by my colleague Ted Green from Great Britain, and they're all trees uh, that are in what's called the Great Windsor Park. It's the huge park that's associated with the Windsor Castle in Britain and has been in the royal family for, you know, a thousand years. And on those lands, they have trees that have grown and never been pruned, never been touched. So this is how trees progress getting into, let's say this is the stage four or five, that nice, big, open canopy. And then we get this is probably more around the eight, stage six or seven, the champion tree that we, um, you know, in, if you're not aware of the champion tree program, uh, the champion trees are calculated by a combination of what is their height, what is their spread, what, which was the national champion white oak uh, champion tree. And when I saw it, it had about a mile of cables up in the canopy holding everything together. And that's completely counter to what the tree would want to do getting into its older stages. It would want to shed some of its parts. Uh, trees are shedding organisms. It's normal for them to drop branches. And what ended up happening with that tree is that in a windstorm, the whole thing, all of it, blew over because it was quite hollow in the main stem. And because of this will or desire to keep it the national champion, they killed it. And now that whole tree is gone. And I think it would have been better to manage that tree by letting it get smaller or making it smaller. And if we have to let another tree become the champion, that's just fine. But let's keep the tree around. And so as we get into starting into these later stages, you can start to see flecks of white in the canopy. 
mostly on the periphery at the top of the tree. That's where the tree is naturally dying back. It's not sick. It's not in decline. It's just aging. And here they call this a stag-headed tree. You can see the white uh, dried out old uh, deadwood in the canopy. And if we get to the next slide, this I really like this one. Here you can really see the superstructure of the tree is still here. But many or most of the big branches that were spreading out have broken off and the top is dying back. But you can see down here that the canopy is getting thicker and thicker as new growth starts happening lower in the tree. And so that growth is, is closer to the roots. It's um, closer to the main stem, less likely to break off. So old trees, which, which are left to their own devices, uh, and I say leave them alone if you can, put a fence around them, get the people away, and let's just watch them do their own thing. Um, and here's the next stage. You can see the whole canopy is gone, but the trees, certainly, I'm not dead yet. This tree doesn't want to be cut down. It wants to keep going. And at the very end, you can see a tree here with just this last remnant of the main stem, and all, virtually all of this growth on here uh, is regrowth that happened uh, as the tree grew itself smaller and smaller. Um, and then in the bottom here, which is a small picture you can't see, but this is a very famous tree in Britain. It's called the Bowthorpe Oak. It's over a thousand years old. It's completely hollow. Uh, you can stand with 25 to 30 people in that tree. But growing off that out, outer shell is this very small canopy that sustains the tree and keeps it alive. Uh, so, you know, these are, these are extreme examples. This is a managed tree, the pollarded tree, and that's what allowed it to get so big and so hollow without falling apart. And this is an unmanaged tree that has slowly over time shed its parts and become smaller. And this is a last example of that. This is, to me, just blows my mind. Um, here's a tree that they happen to have this series of photographs. So in 1910, you see this tree here. It's got a canopy, but it's got this wispy growth coming out of the out of the stem, perhaps uh, getting kind of stressed. In the 20s, you see here, the canopy is, is declining. Less growth up there, but more growth down here. And as we go along, we get to 2009, and here's the tree. It's, if you look at that tree, if you, you know, most arborists, if you looked at this tree here, they'd say, oh, it's declining. It's in the spiral of decline. Maybe, you know, we should cut it down because it's going to get dangerous. And 100 years later, you look at this tree and you see a perfectly healthy and vigorous tree. And not every tree can do this, but it's just an example of what, you know, what trees are capable of. And these are the kind of things that bring me sort of wonder and, and amazement with trees. Um, so when we're dealing with uh, trees as they get older, um, we have to consider that, um, that trees can become more dangerous as they develop uh, some of their old uh, features. Uh, this is a slide that my colleague Neville, Pay, Neville Fay put together, and it's called the hazard versus habitat, or hazard and habitat slide. So there's 20 features identified on this tree that, um, as an arborist, if you were trained as an arborist, you would, you would identify it as a potential hazard. So we have dead wood, we have a crown limb with a large cavity, we have fungal growth on a limb, we have bracket fungi. All these things which we have been trained to look for and say, that's a problem. Uh, on the other side, if we take an ecological perspective and we take away the people aspect and the fact that, that we're worried about parts falling out of the tree, for the tree and for the tree associates, once we start to develop these features, the tree starts to become even more valuable from a habitat perspective. Um, we talk about, in a technical term, saprozylic habitat. Saprozylic is dead wood habitat. And so for every one of these features that we can identify as a hazard on this side, we can look on the other side and, and find a, a unique species that needs that habitat to grow. So major deadwood subject to failure on this side, major deadwood, sunbaked, arid deadwood is unique habitat for longhorn beetles. If we go to number 11, scar tissue from old wound, decay may lead to trunk failure. And 11 over here, scar tissue is uh, providing um, bark beetles and spiders and other, other habitat for other species. And so we can't keep every old tree around, uh, but if we can keep more of them around, then they, I like to think of the conservation of some of these old trees as sort of an arc of biodiversity. If we keep some of these trees around, 
then some of these species that uniquely can grow here may be able to persist and find their way to the next old tree around. Um, and, and so I've, I've been doing a lot of reading about this. One of the things they talk a lot about is, is old beetles. Uh, uh, some of the rarest beetles that we can find are found in old trees. And I've been reading about it. And then one day I was working on this tree. It's uh, in, right in the center of Toronto in Queen's Park. It was an old red oak, very hollow. Everybody was worried about it. Um, and I recommended that it should be kept. Unfortunately, um, it's gone now. But I went here to... Uh, Newspaper asked me to take some photographs, and I was looking around. They wanted a picture of me at the base of the tree, and I was looking in the tree, and lo and behold, I found this beetle in there, this massive beetle. I've never seen a beetle that big. But it sort of was uh, a, an aha moment where I'd read about this stuff, but here I was inside, you know, pulling into a tree and finding these, um, you know, interesting insects. And I think other arborists who are here who have dismantled trees and, and worked with old trees and old parts have probably found all kinds of things they've never seen before crawling out of old dead trees. So um, an important aspect of, of the trees in the urban, urban setting, we often find these guys, the raccoons living in trees. Uh, mothers bear their babies. This one's actually right on my office property and every year the mother comes and has her babies in the tree. And then one day we saw this guy and I think this guy, if you can see him, that's a raccoon there. Uh, I think this was the day after garbage day, and he had a good night, but could, couldn't quite get back into his cavity. Um, but I always like to say in, in the urban setting, you know, raccoons are really destructive a lot of times. They, they get, get into our buildings. They do a lot of damage. If we have some hollow trees around, then they're going to go and live there. And, and, and so habitat is an important part. Uh, and then lastly, getting closer to home here, uh, again, you know, just these are disparate types of research that have all come to the same place. So this is Steve Sillett. Uh, many of you will have heard of him. He's a preeminent researcher working in the sequoia trees and the redwoods and the giant sequoias. And they do just immaculate, immaculate research. He's been published in Science and Nature and National Geographic. Um, and just quickly, one study they did, they looked at a hectare of land uh, in, in the redwood forest and they count every tree, they climb every tree, they categorize every branch, all that data. And from a, from, a, from a habitat perspective, I found it really interesting. They had 115 trees in the hectare. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but these are all the massive giants. Um, and what they found is that 12 trees out of that 115 had 95% of all of the biodiversity in the forest, just 12 trees. But they were all the old trees with the broken tops, with the fire scars. And they found things like salamanders, which we expect to see on the, on the forest floor. Freshwater uh, you know, organisms in pools of water, hundreds of feet up in the crown. Other species growing out of hollows in the tree. And this thing, this picture here, which you won't see very well, but aerial soil. So the crook of a branch in a tree that grows for a thousand years gets materials falling down into it, attracts insects, and eventually it turns, compost down, turns into soil, and you get plants growing out of these soil beds. Some of these soils are, you know, a meter, three, four feet deep. Um, so all kinds of interesting things growing out of old trees. The flip side of that hazard versus habitat was, um, is, is hazard and risk assessment. So because of my will, my desire, my passion, I hope you can see for keeping old trees around, but I work with clients and they own those trees. So I can't counsel people to keep trees which are dangerous, uh, it wouldn't be good for them and it could be very bad for me and my liability. So early on I started looking at, at tree risk assessment and um, you know, we, I was thinking today, you know, when Michael was introducing, he was saying 20 years and if we look down here we can see 20 years of, of change and innovation and you can see, you know, several people have come here from other places, picked up on these ideas and the the places we've gone in terms of attachments to trees and respecting for trees are amazing. And similarly, uh, I, I think about my career in arboriculture, and at the same time, we've had a real advancement in knowledge and technique in, in the arboricultural world. So risk assessment, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. At the start, we used drills to drill into trees. This is a mechanical drill. Scott has had one here before. We don't have one today. But this drilling instrument basically measures, as you a fine drill goes into a tree, it measures 
how much resistance there is to that drill going into the tree. So if the wood's solid and hard, if there's a high resistance for that drill bit going in. If we get into decayed areas or hollow areas, all of a sudden there's no resistance and you see a spike in your, in your readings. One of the downfalls is that you're actually drilling into the tree and, and there are potentially impacts to the tree that can, can be caused by drilling into it. And so for early on, for me, I had one of these instruments, but I, I got worried that, you know, I'm trying to find out about the safety of this tree because I want to keep it for a long time. If my assessment method might be contributing to the decline of the tree, then that's not so good. So we've, um, we've had a lot of advancements. We have some people here from Germany, and the Germans have to really be credited for taking their, you know, inquisitive, engineering-based approach uh, and bringing us some new tools. So one tool is uh, sonic tomography using sound waves to generate an image of the internal decay. And I'll be talking about that later on this afternoon. But um, working with that equipment, we can get images, and they're small here, but you see these colored images. And these colored images where there's brown, there's solid wood. Where there's green, it's a kind of a transition. And where we see these blue and violet areas, that's wood that's either so decayed or hollow that sound doesn't travel through. So we can now, by putting a series of nails just on into the inside of the wood, we can get a lot of information with a little bit of damage to the tree and no, none of the serious risks of drilling into the center of the tree which decay may be living in. And I'll speak more about that later. We also have now uh, engineering based methods. So the pulling test, which I started to show the other day and I will give a demonstration of this afternoon. Uh, basically uh, using a winch and simulating a wind acting on a tree and then measuring either at the base of the tree if the root plate is moving, so for stability of trees, uh, or with these instruments on the stem, finding out whether the stem has um, you know, strength in, in bending for, for whether, whether it's safe to, to put something in or to, to keep it there because whether, what, uh, will it break or not? How am I doing in time? Not too bad. Ten more minutes. Um, and then just to see, you know, again, you know, we've had all of this progression uh, in our hardware, and we've been working with scientists like Charlie Greenwood, who was here yesterday, and all of the other innovators here who have been advancing the equipment. Um, I've been lucky enough to, you know, through my interest in risk assessment, be working with the community that is moving some of this forward. And just to show where some of the stuff might be going, by happenstance, one of our, our friends... Uh, figured out that his ne next door neighbor was working for NASA and working with some very you know advanced photographic techniques so that they could determine strains on surfaces without testing the material. So this is like the shuttle and they're able to use their uh, photographic equipment to detect areas where strains are, are high and, and perhaps detect weaknesses that they couldn't find other ways and um, and so they all got together and said well you know we're doing this tree biomechanics stuff do you think this could be applicable so we've done some work where we tried to use this type of work and so just a couple of quick examples this was um, we set up a bunch of targets in the, cr in the crown of a little tree and we did what's called a pluck test we pulled the tree really tight and then we released it and using this type of photography, we could actually see very, um, so I'm going to turn a little video on, and you'll see the tree start to shake around. Um, here we go. Whoops. So if you watch the video, we pluck the tree, and then you see these lines forming, and those are, the, the longer the line or the darker the line means the more movement. So we can now start to study some of the um, mechanical issues in the tree, how branches uh, help to dissipate energy in the tree. Uh, we can use this type of technique, for example, we could now prune this tree and thin it out, which us arborists we really don't like, uh, but we can thin a whole bunch of branches out and test it again and see if the tree is moving more or moving less. So we can now start to study some of our pruning techniques with methods like so, this. In fact, therefore, tree absolutely is rocking. It is, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
And then, you know, another use, uh, uh, one of the things that we do with some of our pulling instruments is we measure strains in wood when they're under loading. And uh, we, we were, this was a sort of a trial day. We met in a parking lot in Ohio, and the guy from Nassau kind of snuck his gear out for the weekend, and we all met, and we did some tests to see whether we were going to go forward. So we did a, a little test. This is a branch here, and, and this, the video goes very quickly, but there's a scale here, and the zero means there's no strain, and the, high, uh, the, the, the red means major strain. And you're going to see a, 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 a video go very quickly of this branch being pulled down. And if you watch at the very end, just near the very end in this area, you'll see the colors, the colors go from here all the way to here just before the branch broke. So um, we may be able to use this kind of technique to understand the architecture and the strength of branches better. So I'll, I'll run, run it, and you see just before it breaks, you see that high strain developing. And I'll run it one more time because it goes so quickly. But these are just examples of where we are and, 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 and where the you know, how the science is advancing in our realm of, of risk assessment of trees, just like the science and the approach is advancing in the tree world of how to, how to put tree houses, uh, more uh, tree-friendly um, techniques to put them into trees. And then one last one here, we were looking at, we were also looking at um, uh, uprooting of trees, which is something we do with tree pulling tests. And so, again, using these photographs, our photographic uh, techniques, we put all these little targets on the ground, and they're white targets with a black dot in them. And the way the cameras work is they have two cameras looking down, and if, the, if those start to move, those two cameras see the differences. And so what we see is we're going to, we were pulling on this tree, and we're, we're looking at the uprooting behavior at the base, so you'll see some arrows start to come out of the ground, and it's measuring how much lift is occurring in the root system. Again, all done with, with photographs. So as we, here we go, as we pull on the tree, you start to see these vectors um, of where, where the, the root plate is lifting. So we can, you know, again, we may be able to use this type of technique um, to, to start to understand the uprooting behavior of trees. Just, just some ideas about, you know, what we're doing and, and where we might be I'm almost at the end of my talk now, so bring it back around to how did I get here and why are we here. So when I first met Scott in 2006, he brought me to Seattle because he wanted me to use some of my advanced uh, methods to test some significant trees that he had. And I got there and I said, well, Scott, one of the deals is you need to take me up a big tree because I'm from the East Coast and I climbed all my life and I climbed big rocks, but I'd never climbed a big tree. So this was a Douglas fir just outside of Seattle. And our friend Matt came along, and you know we used the big shot technique to get a rope up in the tree. And I started. We started climbing up, and I got to the top of the tree. And you know, this is this for me was really exciting to be way up here, and and the kind of views that you can get. You know, I have a talk about all of this. I call it views from the top. But when you get to the top of the tree and you get to look out, it gives you a unique perspective. Um, and so from there. Uh, you know, this was about a 200-foot tree, and I was talking with Scott, and he said, well, I know where some even bigger trees are. we got to go to down to Out and About Tree Zort and climb the boundary tree. And uh, so uh, in 2007, I got the chance to come through Scott and Jake and Michael. I was invited to, to speak here. Um, and, and uh, you know, my mind was opened up. These were some of the first real tree houses that I saw. And I was just amazed. Um, and Michael's house, which some of you may have seen or will see. Uh, and then we went up to the boundary tree, a big old sugar pine up on the hill, on the ridge. Yeah, that's, that's, this is uh, way up the hill, way past the boundary tree. Okay, further up then. Uh, maybe I, I, I misspoke. But we went way up the ridge to where there's a collection of big trees. And um, on this day, Michael Oxman, who's right here, uh, was on a tree about, you know, maybe 100, 200 feet away from us, and here, you know, he is standing right up in the top of the tree. So the big tree climbers like to get up on the top and surf right above the branches. Uh, but you can see the kind of views that you get from up there. Now, uh, I think Scott may be willing or may be entertaining, some of the other climbers may be entertaining going up to some of these trees. So if you're interested in getting up in one of these big trees, there may be an opportunity over the course of the weekend um, you know, that's looking one way over to the other valley. 
that's looking down here uh, into, into this valley. And the year we were there um, in the property just, just down the way, they had a big, um, what is it, the trade fair, I think it is? Barter, and all, barter fair. Barter fair. And all these people came in, and as part of the barter fair, they had a, had a, um, a concert going, and they were playing fantastic jazz. And we were standing, sitting up in the top of this tree, having these views, listening to jazz music waft up from the valley. So pretty uh, amazing opportunity. Um, and then this is, uh, this is at the top of the, of the giant redwood that we went to see with Sillet. The top was dead, but I'm, I'm at about 345 feet above the ground here. And Scott was with me. Uh, this was one of our, as Scott said, you know, this stands out as, you know, it's like tree porn for us, you know, and this is like about as, as good as it gets, uh, going to the top of one of the biggest trees in the world. And um, I'm almost done. I wanted to really put up this slide to emphasize once again what I said before. The roots of the trees, protecting the roots, is probably the most important message that you might get from me or from Scott as we go through this. Um, the disturbance, disturbance in the root system can really reduce the tree vitality. It can even affect the stability over time. And importantly, the root system of the tree is not a reflection of the canopy going down. The root system of the tree is shallow and extensive. And that shallow, extensive root system is all the fine root systems. They're in the first part of the soil. They're tiny little roots, and they collect water. They collect uh, air and they collect nutrients. And so protecting the, the, that fine root system, they're very much affected by compaction, and that's really important. And I will speak a little bit about that this afternoon. So just to wrap it up, I mean, the design of tree houses is, is only limited by your imaginations, the designers, the builders. We saw Taka's stuff last night. What an amazing imagination for design. But the common denominator of all of this is that they're built on or in or among trees. So trees is at the root of tree houses. And um, it's a critical factor. And just as a segue into my talk that I'm going to do this afternoon, uh, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is basically four key considerations for any tree house design and build. And, and it's these four steps. So first, selecting the tree, uh, preparing the tree for, for putting a tree house in it, protecting the tree during the build, and then after the build, what are we going to do? How are we going to monitor it? How are we going to take care of the tree? And I'm going to run through that in my presentation this afternoon. And at the end of my presentation, we'll do a quick demonstration of tomography and tree pulling tests. And uh, last picture, I've been working with a, a building group in Quebec. And um, unfortunately, the forest that they have is a young forest. Uh, it's been cut several times. And there's actually quite a lack of really good candidate trees, but they were contracted to put 10 structures in. Uh, so they found, they built this one, and this one is one of my favorite sort of tree house type things without a tree. It's actually built on two great big boulders that they found in the forest, glacial erratic boulders uh, that were left there. And they bolted onto one and then rested on the other one. And, and uh, so, you know, um, you can build a treehouse type structure without actually uh, being in trees. You, know, you still get the same feel when you're up on the here that you're in the canopy of the trees, but there was actually no, con no worries or no considerations for damaging trees by having this one here. So that's it for my morning talk. I'll thank you very much, and if there's any questions or time to answer them, I'll have the afternoon here. Jake, do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there was one at the back. <coughs> How deep is the hole compared to the height that has been? Uh, minimal. The roots? The majority of the roots are in the top two feet of soil. The, the majority of the roots. The only place where you get really deep roots generally is near the base of the tree, the structural roots, which tend to be bigger and go down for anchorage, or in um, difficult situations where the water table is low or in rocks where the roots have to move somewhere else to get their nutrients. But really, it's, it's, you know, as I showed in that slide, there's, there's no comparison between the depth of the roots and the height of the trees. It's like us, like a foot kind. 